In the southern mountains of modern-day Iran sits the ceremonial capital of the Achaemenid Empire, commonly referred to as the First Persian Empire. The largest structure at this capital was named the Upper Dana at Persepolis, and featured walls covered in carved recounts of delegations from around the ancient world arriving to bring gifts to the emperor of Achaemenid Persia. Several animals are brought to Apadana across these carvings, mostly camels, sheep, and horses, but one such carving depicting a delegation from Ethiopia features an unusual looking creature. This is regarded as the earliest known visual depiction of an animal that eluded Western science for a very, very long time. Join me as we search for the so-called African Unicorn. Now we've already begun our search for this creature in Iran, in the Eastern Middle East. Persepolis today is now a UNESCO heritage site, but at the time of the search of the African Unicorn, the ruins of Persepolis were still around 40 years away from being excavated. So our search actually begins in the year 1887. Reports and journal entries are coming out of not the Middle East, but Central Africa, rumoring the supposed existence of a large jungle herbivore perhaps some kind of donkey named the Ati. The animal is described as very dark with white stripes, and if we know of any animal that is both a donkey and dark with white stripes, then of course we know we are looking for some kind of zebra. This is an unusual revelation. Zebras eat grass and live on open plains where they can spot predators from a distance. And there isn't a lot of grass or open space in the Central African rainforest, so this zebra must be a new species? 20 years of just rumors before we start to receive actual clues. After having prevented two indigenous Mbuti people from, no lie, being abducted by a showman in the Congo, a British commissioner was taken by the Mbuti to find the African unicorn. He sends reports back of tracks, and to our surprise, these tracks are cloven hoofed. Now horses, donkeys, and zebras all have one single hoof. So this report suggests that this is not some kind of zebra at all, but maybe some kind of deer, antelope, or gazelle. After hearing this, interest in the animal spikes, as now there is some kind of zebra-looking antelope that exists deep in a rainforest in the middle of Africa and is incredibly difficult to traverse, and it seems to only rarely be spotted by even the indigenous people of the region. The search continues, and we cross into the 20th century. At this time, the Paris Metro finishes construction. The world's first airship completes its maiden voyage, and modern air conditioning is on the verge of being released to the world. Yet somehow, the Western world was still unable to find the African unicorn. Soon, that same British commissioner that found the tracks obtains pieces of hide that were made from the skin of the African unicorn, and more importantly, a skull. Looking at the skin first, we discover that this animal does indeed have dark and white stripes, but the dark coloration is more reddish than you would expect from a zebra, and these stripes aren't vertical, they are horizontal. We've also heard that these stripes only exist on the animal's legs. Looking deeper, this fur is very thick and velvety, and while the reports seem to describe an antelope or gazelle at this stage, there is only one other African animal that has skin quite like this. The skull reveals a lot more, and it confirms the theories that arise from the fur. First, this is without a doubt a completely new species, and we aren't just getting mixed messages or accidentally following clues that actually belong to several different animals. Second, 
This animal's skull has both the same cranial shape and dental structure of a giraffe. A small giraffe, but a giraffe nonetheless. Beyond overall shape, the skull also has ossicones, which are bone growths that extend out of the head, much like what giraffes have. The fact that an animal the size of a small giraffe is still unknown to the Western world at this time is bizarre, and fuels the curiosity of around this animal even more. Then, deep in the Congo Basin, an English zoologist finally finds it and describes it for Western science for the first time. This species is not shaped so much like a horse or an antelope, but actually has a similar angled body structure of a giraffe just with a much shorter neck. Looking at it now, the similarities with giraffes become more and more apparent. Not only does it have ossicones, those bony extrusions, but the tongue of the African unicorn is very long and very blue, just like a giraffe's. This animal is initially labeled Equus Johnstoni because the zoologist in question didn't get the memo about people already knowing it's a giraffe relative just yet and named it after a horse, but it is later changed into a genus of its own, within the family Giraffidae. This animal is named Ocarpia Johnstoni. Johnstoni comes from Harry Johnston, the British commissioner that obtained the skull, skin, and tracks. The name then given to this animal is Ocarpi, which comes from either Mbuba or Lese, which are two regionally local languages that describe markings made on arrows that resemble the Okapi stripes. With the mystery solved, we determined that their native range is predominantly in the famous Congo Basin. There have also been sightings in today's Virunga National Park, famous for its mountain gorillas and the ongoing conflict with oil barons that want to destroy the national park to drill for oil. The Okapis were also found in the Semuliki Valley, in the neighboring nation of Uganda, but it's thought that they have been extinct here since the 1970s. With so many issues surrounding the conservation of the Okapi, it's no wonder that they disappeared again. Natuur heeft tot voor kort de Okapi verborgen gehouden in de oerwouden van de Congo. Nu logeert een Okapi-familie in Blijdorp. Het dier lijkt veel op de giraf en men noemt hem dan ook wel Woutgiraf. Okapi have been kept in zoos since 1919. The breeding programs have been reasonably successful, though this depends on your definition of successful. Right now, their focus seems to be on increasing the overall number of this endangered species, and there does not seem to be any large-scale effort uh, to release Zubrid Okapi back into the wild. And the reason for this is likely political. The Democratic Republic of the Congo is a volatile nation. The Congo's current crises are characterized by political instability, humanitarian challenges, and ongoing armed conflict. There are, at the time of writing this, more than 100 different armed groups, all fighting over ethnic tensions, mineral resources, regional rivalries, and the curse of having an incredible number of natural resources that the world's corporate interests are willing to fight to gain control of. The United Nations has been attempting to intervene and aid this nation, but the mission has proved vastly unpopular, and they are leaving in 2024. The African Union has also been attempting regional diplomacy and peacebuilding through mediation and disarmament, and reintegration programs, among other possible solutions. It's difficult to look at this nation and not talk about the horrific oppression of the Congolese people under Belgian rule, among other European powers. This oppression only ended in 1960, and there are people in the Congo today who grew up under the rule of a nation that did not care about their country or people beyond economic exploitation. It was Belgium that captured the first Okabi in 1919 to be displayed in a zoo. Once the Belgian government left the Congo, it was replaced by a time known as the Congo Crisis. During this time, 
evidence of the ongoing existence of Okapi dries up a bit. These animals have never been officially declared extinct in the wild, but it may be these animals are so reclusive that is reason enough to believe that they might still be out there despite evidence. In 1958, Virunga National Park saw its last evidence of Okapi populations. In 1987, the Okapi Conservation Project was founded to protect the habitat of Okapi and work with local communities to educate and ensure the ongoing health of the rainforest. This was followed by the founding of the Okapi Wildlife Reserve in 1992, which was listed as a World Heritage Site four years later. In this area of rainforest, signs of Okapi and even sightings persist and there are many Okapi in the Okapi Wildlife Reserve's headquarters during this time that are a part of a breeding program. But evidence of their existence in the Greater Reserve is, at the very least, reduced. It's heartbreaking, but it's beginning to look more and more like the Okapi in zoos and breeding programs are the last in the world. 20 years go by, and in 2008, in Virunga National Park around 100 kilometers to the southeast of the Okapi Wildlife Reserve, a camera trap is set off in the middle of the night. After 50 years of no evidence of Okapi in Virunga, we have our first photo of an Okapi in the wild. It took until 2008 to capture a photo of the African unicorn in its natural habitat, and here we are. Today, Okapi still exist in the wild, and it is still an everyday struggle to keep their habitat and populations protected. This region is not only home to the endangered Okapi, but also forest elephants, leopards, bongo, chevrotain, and many other animals that make up the beautiful diversity of the Congo rainforests, all of which are protected by the wildlife reserve. But, 12 years ago, militants in the area attacked the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. Several people, as well as all 14 Okapi in the breeding program headquarters, lost their lives. I want to acknowledge the incredible human beings who work with Okapi today. They brave awful and violent conditions placed on them by a nation that is still experiencing countless crises in the aftermath of more than 500 years of invasion and oppression by European powers. I will be donating all ad revenue from this video to the Okapi Conservation Project who helped set up and continue to maintain the reserve. And if you would also like to donate or support them by purchasing something through their store, the link to their website will be in the video description below. This whole video has been from the perspective of Western science, and of course, indigenous people of Central Africa knew about the Okapi long before Western scientists did, and many European scientists that actually went on these early expeditions in the 19th and 20th centuries were not good people. Often, their treatment of the indigenous peoples was both violent and cruel, and many of them played large parts in the colonization and invasion of the African continent. In order to protect the species of our world, we need to help people provide for themselves, build governments that value freedom to form strong, empathetic communities, and value the lives of both humans and animals alike. Our path and the future of many endangered species are intertwined, and only by caring for and uplifting communities can we reduce our negative impact on the world around us. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Ben the Quasi Ecologist, this is The Natural World Explored, and until next time, stay curious, friends. Shout out to Friggin' Frog Lover and Nicholas Hennessy who helped make this episode happen. You guys are incredible. Thank you so much.